So you have texts in your bulletin of the, um, the text we're looking at today, 2 Corinthians 12, and we'll jump, jump back to chapter 11, and then further on we're looking at Matthew. I heard a, um, a story, well it wasn't really a story, but I was talking with a man at TPR last week, and sitting with him, and, and I was asking how he's been doing, and how, is, how, how things have been going, and he says, well, I feel like I'm, I'm a lazy guy. I said, okay, what do you mean you feel like you're a lazy guy? He says, well, I used to do all this stuff and have all these things to do, and, and now I just sit here. And he says, I, I know the things I could be doing or should be doing, and I still have some strength left, but I'm not doing them. So I'm a, I'm a pretty lazy guy. And he kept sort of talking like this, on and on. And this guy comes over from this other table. He says, don't listen to him. He's, he's, he's pulling your leg. He's not a lazy guy. He says, what do you mean I'm not a lazy guy? I don't do anything. I just sit here and get, get going. And he says, well, you're not a lazy guy. He says, you are a hard worker your whole life, and you're still a hard worker, and God still has many things planned for you and, and the energy you have left. Just because you can't do what you used to be able to do it doesn't mean you're a lazy guy. And he says, oh, well, a feather in my cap then, right? And then it keeps going, and the guy leaves, and then he turns to me. Yeah, I'm a lazy guy. <laughs> so he, was, he was convinced that he was a lazy guy, right? And yet someone else comes along and has seen the way he interacts, the way he works, and says, you can't possibly be a lazy guy. I've seen other people around here who are definitely lazy, and, and you're not one of them. Um, See, I think there's ways in which we can tear ourselves down with our words, but also there's ways in which we can humble ourselves with our words. And it's not necessarily about the words that we're using, but it's about what's in our heart and why we're doing it. Um, we're talking talk about boasting, talking about being proud or being humble. And talk about what we boast in and how this boasting thing should happen. Um, in 2 Corinthians 12, looking at verse 2, it starts out with these words. It says, I know a person, and it might be said differently in your translation, but I'd like to retranslate it and say, I know a guy. Have you ever heard that, right? I know a guy who can do this or who has done this. Or, and you go off to tell this grand story about this guy that you know who's done these things or this girl that you know, and, and, and it's this wonderful story. And people learn from that experience, right? People learn from hearing about what someone has, else has done that has been positive, and we grow. As we go, oh, I could be more like that. Or I could learn from that experience. Or I could incorporate some of that into my life. And that's how we, as people, grow. And so 2 Corinthians 12, he's starting out by saying, I know a guy, or I know a person. He says, in Christ, he was 14 years, it was 14 years ago, was caught up, to the third heaven. Whether in body or out of the body, I don't know. God knows. And I know that such a person, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard things that are not to be told that no mortal is permitted to repeat. So Paul admits he doesn't really understand all the details surrounding this, this story that he's heard. But he knows a guy who went to heaven. And we can argue all day about what that means. People like to look at this verse and go, what does it mean? But I think Paul clearly says, I don't know what it means. I don't know whether it was in the body, whether it was out of the body. Only God knows how this exactly happened or what this exactly means. But this guy says he went to heaven. Whether he was in a, a heavenly state while on the earth, having reached full maturity in Christ, whether he was at peace with himself and the world around him, whether he... Uh, we say that he could see through the veil of the spiritual realm, whether he was actually physically transported from the earth to another physical space. These are all different ways that people think about and talk about heaven. And my answer to all that is we don't really know. But what's important is that he went to heaven. See, we love to argue about these things. We like to have our own opinions about what does it mean to go to heaven or what does it mean to be in heaven whether in this life or in the afterlife. But Paul dismantles this whole thing before it even gets going because he knows the first thing that he's 
people are going to think when he says, I know a guy who went to heaven, everyone's going to think, oh, what does that mean? Maybe, maybe he thought he went to heaven, or maybe he, you know, or maybe they think heaven isn't a physical place, so did you actually go there? Or all these things that would be going through people's heads. He says, let's not worry about that. Let's not think about that, because only God knows. What's important is I know this story about a guy who went to heaven. I don't know how it happened, but that's the point. What's important to Paul is that this man was granted passage into a state of perfection and peace with God, with himself and with the world. He entered into paradise. And then he says, on behalf of such a one, I will boast. I know a guy living the dream in the presence of God, always at peace, always happy. Whatever your vision of what heaven is like, think about a person who is like that. And that's something to talk about. Because it reminds us that there is a way to be better than we are today. It encourages us to press on through what we aren't so proud of in ourselves because of what we can prou be proud about in other people. Because we all do things we're not proud of. We all do things that we feel will hold us back, will tie us down, will destroy us. In verse 5 it continues and it says, On my own behalf I will not boast except in my weakness. See, boasting about other people encourages us. But why boast about our own weaknesses? We try to avoid our weaknesses, don't we? We cover them up or we transform them into strength and we love the stories about the underdog becoming the hero, the poor guy becoming the millionaire. But Paul says we, we, we should find greater pride in what we don't have not waiting until we have it to look back and say, look what we have now, look what we don't ha didn't have then. And this keeps our self-esteem in check. Not boasting about others and feeling bad about ourselves, that I could never be like that person, but realizing that I actually could be like that person, that that is a certain way, a certain trajectory of life that can lead me into better in myself, and so I will boast about that person. I will take pride in that person. I will celebrate what they have gone through and learn and grow. Second Corinthians 11, if we jump back, we see some of the context. Paul likes to talk a lot about boasting, probably because he has a lot to boast about, and yet he doesn't often boast about it. And so whenever he finds someone who's boasting about something he doesn't feel like they should be proud about, he makes sure to bring it up and say, look, what are you doing? I've got all these things I could be boasting about, but that's not the way I choose to run my life. Um, 2 Corinthians 11, he's in the context where he's talking about people who are fools. He says, all these fools are all around and they're boasting about this and they're boasting about that. He says, let me be foolish for a moment. Give your ears to me for a minute and let me show you what this looks like when someone boasts. And I want, as I read this, you just think about how this would be perceived by you if someone was talking this way to you. Um, so, uh, 2 Corinthians 11, starting at verse 21, it says, Whatever anyone else dares to boast about, I'm speaking as a fool, and I also dare to boast about it. Are they Hebrews? Well, so am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I'm out of my mind to talk like this. Well, I am more. I've worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the forty lashes minus one. And three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea, and I have been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and I have toiled and have go often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I've been cold and naked. 
And besides everything else, I face daily the pressures of my concern for all of the churches. Who is weak? And I do not feel weak. Who is led into sin? And I do not inwardly burn. And then he says, if I must boast, I will boast about the things that show my weakness. Now when you hear that, it almost sounds like Paul is making a case for why he should win an award. At least for me, that's how it comes across. He's, shall we say, the prized um, worker in the kingdom of God. And if God awards for the hardest worker, Paul would definitely get the gold medal. And he could choose to boast about all these things. He, could, he says, let me, let me talk like a fool for a moment. And then he goes off and says all these things. He says, I could be saying all these things. I could be constantly reminding you of how much I have done and how I deserve some kind of reward. But he says, no, other people boast like fools. And see how that sounds? See how it sounds when you yourself boast? It just sounds like you're being a fool. He says, if you want to have a contest... I would win. And if you think you have it tough, well, you, you haven't seen it coming. Have you heard someone say that before? Maybe you're complaining about something and someone says, well, you think you have it tough and they go on to tell their story about how worse their life is or you think you have it well off and then they start telling you about how much better their life is. And you, it's all this contest, this game that we play with each other to try and one-up the next person, Right? And Paul says, I could talk in that way. I could say things that way. I could play this fool's game with you, but I choose not to. Because it's not about the celebrations and the gold stars. It's not a contest. In summary, if we jump back to chapter 12, which feels like silly to say this is a summary of chapter 11, uh, but this is sort of a flowing through. Chapter 12, verse 6, he says, If I wish to boast... I will not be a fool, for I will be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think better of me than what is seen in me or heard from me, even considering the exceptional character of the revelations. So other people can boast about me, but I really don't need to toot my own horn. I mean, there's all these amazing things that have happened to me. There's all these things I could be saying. But I refrain from doing so. Continues on, and the rest of verse 7 says, Therefore, to keep me from being too elated or too proud, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. And three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. And so I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. If we don't recognize our weaknesses and submit them to God, he cannot work on them. His grace is for everyone. But only those who admit they are sinners actually receive the grace. His healing is for everyone and all areas of our life. But only when we admit we are sick can we receive the healing. We either receive salvation or we simply hear about salvation. There are many who listen to sermons, who read the Bible, who study it, who put on a, a Christian face, who call themselves Christians, who maybe even think they are Christians, and they really believe it, but they have not been saved. Many who are not willing to surrender themselves fully to the grace of God so that he may actually save them. We are not willing to boast in our weaknesses to own them, to travel with them, to carry them to the cross and let God heal them. We hear about salvation, but are not actually willing to be saved. 
See, Christianity is not a have your cake and eat it too sort of scenario. We can't hear about salvation, say a magic prayer and then figure, yeah, that was good, and carry on with our life. That's the heart of pride. So I have nothing to work on. I'm perfect just the way I am, and we can tag on the end because of Christ, because it looks better when we do that. But it doesn't change the pride of the statement, does it? See, this can be a potentially useful way to think about our spiritual state, but not a useful mantra to carry us forward in life. We can continually work into the salvation which we have received. And we're not at the wedding feast yet. But we must still respond to the invitation to get there. To understand the context of that analogy, it comes from a parable that we'll look at now in Matthew 22. The parable of the wedding feast. I'm sure you've heard it before. And it's just, we'll, we'll go into it, but it's just talking about how we, ha- we can receive an invitation and we can ignore it or we can travel with it. There's two parts to it, receiving an invitation and then also responding to that invitation. So Matthew 22 says, Jesus spoke to them in a parable saying, The kingdom of heaven, it may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent his servant to call those who were invited to the wedding feast. But they wouldn't come. And again, he sent other servants saying, Tell those who are invited. See, I've prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered. And everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention. And they went off, one to his farm and another to his business. And while the rest seized his servants and treated them shamefully and killed them. And the king was angry. He sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. And then he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready. But those who were invited, they're not worthy. So therefore, go to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and they gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in, To look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot. Cast him into outer darkness, into the place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. See, receiving the invitation is not good enough. We actually have to respond to it. God can call us into a certain area of our life, but unless we go, we do not receive the salvation he has for us in that area. Like a doctor giving a prescription, you first have to go to the doctor, admitting you're sick, receive the prescription from him, take it to the pharmacy, get it filled out, go home, and then actually Take the pills. That's part of the process. And sometimes it's hard. Some people never want to go to a doctor saying, oh, I'm fine. No, I'm fine. I'm not sick. It's okay. It's not a big deal, right? Maybe that person is you. Maybe that person is your spouse and you're budging them like that. You should go to the doctor. We all know know these people, right? Sometimes it's hard to go whether it's because we feel like we can carry on through our own strength and muscle through it, whether because we're ashamed of going, of admitting that in fact we might have something that needs some attention. The difficult process is not the invitation that's sent. The difficult process is responding to it. If we turn back to Corinthians 12, Verse 10, he says, Therefore I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I'm weak, then I'm strong. Salvation sits at this interesting intersection of our weakness and his strength. We like to say we're a sinner saved by grace, or other people like to say I'm a saint. 
And we like to butt heads about these things, right? Say, well, are you a sinner saved by grace or are you a saint? You have to choose one. One is the right way of thinking about it and one is the wrong way of thinking about it. And depending on what denomination you're in, you'll like one versus the other. And maybe you're the black sheep in the family and you like the opposite of what everyone else in your family likes, the way to frame it. But my question is, why not both? If you look at this intersection we're dealing with, we're talking about being a sinner, having our weaknesses out in front of us, truly recognizing them. And yet at the same time, there's verses all over the Bible that talk about his strength. Ephesians 2.6 is a glorious example. It says, God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. It's an incredibly powerful verse. It says, right now I am seated in heavenly places with Christ. Right now I am a saint. True. However, right now I am a sinner. True. Right? I think so often we take these things and we say it has to be this one or it has to be this one. And we pick our favorite verses that back it up. But the problem is someone else has their favorite verses that back up theirs. And that's why there's two differing opinions. And I would like to raise my hands like Paul and say, whether this way or that way, I don't know. God knows. But what's important is what we learn from and what we travel with past to that argument. We all agree that everyone receives the invitation. And right now we are seated at the wedding table spiritually, but not yet there physically. See, we've responded to the call but still have to fully realize that we are there. If we trust we are at the banquet spiritually, we will walk the journey to the banquet. If we assume that the invite is maybe a forgery for us, or maybe we'll be rejected at the door because we took too long to get there, then we aren't really trusting in the grace of God. I think this is the state of the man who was kicked out of the wedding bank banquet. He shows up. He's not really prepared for it. He kind of sits down wondering what's going to happen. And he says, what are you doing here? You don't look like you belong here. You're not celebrating with everyone else. You're not part of this story. And you got, he doesn't have an answer because he doesn't know what to think. He doesn't know what to say. He's kind of sitting there going, well, you know, I wasn't sure if I was supposed to come in or not. I kind of received this invite and then rejected it for a while and then I decided to come to the feast, and everyone was already celebrating, and I wasn't really sure what to do with this, so I wasn't sure if I was actually allowed here. And he gets kicked out. Because if you don't think that you are allowed there, then you're not. If you think, maybe, maybe I'm okay with God, the way I am, and I'll just kind of show up and see what he says then you're not trusting in the grace of God to save you. You're trusting in whatever you happen to piece together to save you. And that's the problem. It's not about whether we are a sinner, whether we are a saint, whether we, whatever this argument is. It's about what's in our heart, what's our attitude, and how we travel with it. The important part is not the gold medal we receive, but... A medal of participation. We all know about those, right? Whether it be from elementary school, high school, I remember I, I, I got medals of participation when you go to a sports game, right? Or you're part of this thing and they go, you got the gold medal for being the best and the silver medal and everyone else gets a green medal or whatever color it was for participating. You go, oh, thanks for whatever this is, right? Participate. It kind of just dismantles the whole thing saying, well, why in the world would you give medals out if everyone gets one? It just seems silly. And in that respect, that makes sense. Okay, why would you give medals out? That's just silly. But at the same time, I think it's a helpful way to think about life. That we're not striving for gold medals, for silver medals. We're striving for a medal at all. We're striving to show up, to participate in life, in the life that God has called us because if we we if let's say the teacher says come out to the sports game you say no thanks you don't get a medal of participation you didn't go and if jesus says come and join in life with me and you say no thanks you don't get a medal of participation but if you show up 
regardless of whether you think you're going to win or not, regardless of how good you feel you are at the game of life, you still get a medal of participation. And everyone gets a medal of participation because you actually decided to show up and to celebrate with him. So the question is, what, what helps you travel with life? What helps you work at life? See, there's two different arguments to this that I've heard, and, and that's why I think the, the, the ways we frame it is less important uh, corporately, but more important individually. For me, it's incredibly helpful to look back at what I said there, Ephesians, what was that, 2, uh, 6, that God raised us up with Christ, seated us with him in heavenly places. It's incredibly helpful for me to know that to be grounded in that, to know that nothing I can do can take me out of the arms of God. Because it will aid me in wanting to journey into that space that I feel spiritually I already am, or that I have faith spiritually I already am. And for some people, that's not helpful at all. For some people, they say, well, God has saved me, so I can go and do whatever I feel like and not worry about what I'm doing in my life. And so in that respect, that way of thinking about things is not incredibly useful for traveling with life. And so that's, again, why these differing opinions come out. Because we all desire the same thing. We all desire to journey to participate in this way, in this life, and not just take the grace of God for granted. So how do we do that well? What is the way that we frame things in our head that is useful for us to be able to journey? Because it's not about the frame, it's about the journey. It's about the life that we lead and what keeps us going, what keeps us walking, what keeps us hearing those stories about other people and, and boasting about that and going, oh, so and so, they did this incredible thing and that encourages me to press on, to keep going, to know that I can be better than I am today, that I can be more prosperous than I am today, that I can be more saved in this area of my life I haven't yet submitted to God because someone else has done it, so I know it's not impossible. And so we journey forward and we continue on. And so we are fully saved, and yet we still work out our own salvation, that interesting intersection we find ourselves in in this life. 